Hello lovely people! Welcome one and all to the first of my videos looking at disability and disability related tropes in media. I absolutely loved making a video about queer coding in Hollywood, click the card in the corner if you haven't seen that already, and using my degree in film history for something more than crying over student loan payments. So you're going to be getting some more analytical media videos coming up. I wanted to start with something that I haven't covered much on my channel yet, autism, because portrayals of autism are often hotly debated. Two autistic people can look at the same character and one declare that it's a bad representation whilst the other can feel seen. Equally there are very differing opinions on characters who have autistic traits but aren't expressly said to be on the spectrum by the writer, director or actor. And is this a good or a bad thing? And then there are just some horrific betrayals and I, I, <laughs> no one's touching those. Thank you to Luke from the channel Miffed Crew and Annie Laney who collaborated with me on this script and helped me to make sure that it's accurate. After all, I'm not autistic myself, I just want to use my platform to help spread information. Hey there, my name is Luke. I'm an autistic creator on YouTube. I run a YouTube channel called Mifku. My animation channel is about Fine Arts at Freddy's and I kind of invented Baby Foxy. I actually don't have any GCSE or normal exam passes here, but YouTube allows me to make a living. I have recently launched a cartoon story time animation channel called Miffed Luke, where I talk about my experiences with hidden disabilities, such as autism. And I do public speaking on my experiences with disabilities. I love gaming and animals. Hello, my name is Annie Sagara, also known as Annie Eleni here on YouTube and on my channel. I talk a lot about disability and LGBT, justice, lifestyle, my thoughts and opinions, and I'm autistic. Side note, I'm going to use the term autistic person rather than person with autism because that's what I've gathered from the autistic community on my channel and also I use identity first language for myself so it feels odd to do it the other way around but you are free to debate that in the comments. Just don't be rude to someone for how they choose to identify. It is personal choice and it's personal. Let's start with a quick refresher. What is autism? Autism is a pervasive developmental disorder and I know, the word pervasive sounds awful, but as a term what it actually means is that it affects more than one area of development. Autism has three primary diagnostic criteria, difficulty in communicating, difficulty in socialising and restricted interests, which can be detected at approximately 18 months but might also not be diagnosed until adulthood. The cause of the disorder is unknown, but it's not vaccines. Autism can present in a variety of ways and to varying severity. Whilst autistic people may have difficulty in communication, both in the physical act and the meta-knowledge of the purpose of certain language, this can range from simply not initiating communication with others to having highly restricted vocabularies or having an absent development of communication. Another symptom is the underdeveloped or absent theory of mind, meaning they might have difficulty recognising the feelings or intentions of others through voice tone, vocal expressions or other social signals. For the majority of people, our brains allow us to pick up on these subtleties and internalise them as we age. We see our parents sigh enough to learn to recognise the frustration in someone's face without explicitly needing to be told what a frown means. But some people's brains just aren't wired that way and need more explicit instructions. Think about the internet, where the majority of communication is text-based. We've developed emojis and shorthand ways of giving tone to our words. If we don't, then our sarcasm can be mistaken as honesty and our joy just falls flat. This difficulty in recognising unspoken social cues, emotions and polite behaviour can be perceived as a lack of sympathy and empathy. When I talked about making this video on Twitter, a number of people said they were most harmed by this perception. A lot of autistic people feel empathy very strongly and it was this misrepresentation that stopped them from seeking a formal diagnosis that could have then greatly benefited their life. Another frequently seen symptom is sensory processing difficulties. This means that your brain struggles with organising and responding to information brought in through the senses. For example, seeing a wide range of colour and patterns or experiencing a loud noise can lead to sensory overload. Understandably, that can create an aversion to certain stimuli, textures, colours, tastes or smells. In the 1998 film Mercury Rising, Bruce Willis playing Bruce Willis is a special agent who must protect a young autistic boy. In his confusion he asks a nurse, autism, does that mean nothing gets through? No. 
She replies, it means everything gets through. The most recognisable symptom of autism in the media is probably restricted interests, a la Rain Man. Although it's not actually very medically significant, it, it does make a good story. Autism may encourage a person to develop an interest in a narrow range of subjects to the extent that it may limit their communication almost exclusively to those things. I mean, sadly, unlike the movies, it probably doesn't cause them to develop superpowers, but we'll get onto that. There are real life positives to autism, as I'm sure people in the comments will share, including a very unique perspective on the world and the ability to drive innovation. Also, I take back the thing about superpowers. I can't say for sure that no one has them. Hollywood autism is a special kind of autism. That was sarcasm. When I asked the members of the Kelgren Fozard Club which disability-related media trope they like me to look at first, they voted overwhelmingly for tropes around autism. By the way, you can become part of the club and help to support this channel by clicking the join button next to this subscribe one. Down there. Many of the clubbies reported that they had delayed getting diagnosis for autism because their only understanding of it came from media and they weren't the standard case. The pop cultural Hollywood representation of autism is probably one you're pretty familiar with. He's a white, cisgender, heterosexual male, usually a child, but if he's an adult, he might as well be a child. He'll fall into one of four categories. The Rain Man, a la Rain Man, the movie. This is disability portrayed as a superpower. I mean, they probably don't treat him like a sentient human being. But hey, at least he can crack a code really quickly or help a betting ring. Because he is an exceptional genius, he must be flawed in all other regards, particularly talking to women. Forrest Gump could arguably be added to this category, but it is debated as to what his formal diagnosis would actually be. So potentially he's just a candidate for ambiguous disorder, which we'll get onto in a minute. Equally, Detective Goran from Law and Order Criminal Intent is awkward. Well, they tried to make him seem exceptionally awkward and obsessed with patterns to the extent that other characters comment on it, but his exceptional attention to detail and problem solving skills make him a great detective. The idiot savant. Also, idiot savant is a really outdated term and not something I love to have to say, but it's the name of the current established media trope because it was once in medical textbooks. So, I mean, please don't use it to discuss a real human being. Thank you. Unlike the Rain Man, he is unable to function at all, except for that one brilliant thing. He has literally no other character traits except, likely, maths. That's it. Just maths. Ooh, or killing people, like Leon in the 1994 film The Professional, which is what it's called in America. In Europe it's just called Leon. He can't read, but he's really, really good at killing people. What a skill. Sean Murphy, the main character of The Good Doctor, is a clear example of being a genius surgeon with autism. Uh, there's also a Disney show, A.N.T. Farm, Ant Farm. That stands for Advanced Natural Talents, and it's an awful name, but it featured Paisley, yay, a girl, who can't read or remember her name, but she can build a functioning helicopter complete with rope ladder out of balloons, as you do. A man-child. Trying to explain that. I mean, we've all seen Hollywood movies at this point, right? A creep. Thanks, Hollywood. Whichever of the categories he falls into, our man is portrayed as lacking emotion, empathy, and compassion. Everyone acts like he's so totally weird and incredibly annoying and a complete burden, but oh well. He is a magical genius, so I guess we just have to put up with him. Nice. Oh, and they're generally played by an actor who is not autistic and likely hasn't ever met someone who is. Although there are examples of autistic adults whose lives are depicted as non-tragic, such as JJ and Skins, those portrayals are sadly far rarer than examples whose lives are shown as tragic. Unfortunately, due to the overwhelming attitude that autism is automatically a tragedy rather than just different, autistic characters are sometimes miraculously cured of their autism, such as Molly in the 1999 film bearing the same name, who is autistic and intellectually impaired, but has genetically modified brain cells implanted in her brain, which increase her social skills, because that's definitely a thing that could happen. Or a more dangerous example is the little girl in Change of Habit who has autism that they decide is just because she's hiding behind a wall of rage to cope with being abandoned so they use the rather abusive rage reduction therapy that magically makes her better rather than what it actually did which was cause deep psychological harm to children so hmm. But hey this is the movies even more icky is the TV show Eureka, which sees the character lose his autism due to time travel. His mother then attempts to stop the return to the correct timeline, despite the consequences, because she prefers her son this way. Mm. 
As we know, real life autism is much more complex than films and TV make it seem, and portraying autism as something seen in only white, straight men can be harmful, especially for a condition that's so varied. Whilst more males than females are diagnosed with autism, plenty of women and non-binary people who have autism do. Research shows that autism actually presents at a relatively even rate in all sexes and is merely more apparent in males due to research bias and young girls being unconsciously taught to hide autistic traits. When I think about autism representation in TV and film, I think it's a bit saturated with the narratives of white men and particularly those with special interests that are either science or math related and savants, which is a totally valid narrative for an autistic person, but because of the saturation, it has created these stereotypes about what people think autism is. The lack of diversity in the representation has been a really big cause of people not recognizing autism within themselves and the implicit biases that professionals have that allow them to deny diagnoses to the people that need it. It is worth noting, and I saw it mentioned often in the Twitter thread discussing good or bad representation that I'm going to link in the description, that autistic people, unlike their Hollywood portrayals, aren't just gifted in maths, music and trains, but also may be very passionate about things like performing arts and painting, and according to one autistic person I know, cheerleading. Because autistic people are like all people, Hollywood, varied. Also, they don't just stop being autistic when it's inconvenient for the plot. We can look at the main character of the show, Atypical, as a good example of Hollywood autism. So the series follows Sam, who is on the autistic spectrum, as he attempts to find a girlfriend and interacts with the rest of his family. He's depicted as unpredictable and childish, with other characters clearly finding him strange. The makers of the show wanted to make Sam break the lack of empathy stereotype, but rather than making him a warm character, they just made him really sex-driven, which Considering the series doesn't actually portray Sam's life as interesting or autonomous, but rather focuses on what a problem he is for the rest of his family, it's not hugely surprising that it was one of the shows that my club members and Twitter followers ranked as the worst representation. Having said that, if you liked the show and saw yourself represented in Sam's character, then you are of course completely entitled to still love it. The good, the bad, and the ugly portrayals. So, what did my viewers think were some good portrayals of autistic people, and what did they think were some bad ones? Well, there was a little controversy on some characters, so let's just dive straight in with the good one. Straight in at the top of good representation was Everything's Gonna Be Okay, a TV show that I hadn't actually ever come across before, so thank you very much for introducing me to it. The series follows 20-something Josh as he suddenly becomes the sole guardian for his two younger half-sisters, one of whom is on the autism spectrum. Matilda is shown struggling with many aspects of life due to her autism, but shocker, she doesn't actually have other character traits. Revolutionary. The show has an autism consultant on staff and the actress who plays Matilda, Kayla Cromer, is actually autistic herself. It is no surprise then that the character is well-rounded and neither a childlike disabled angel or a horrid burden who ruins the lives of those around her. Another potential portrayal that's a little out of the ordinary is Sterling Archer from the series Archer, which is sort of like a comedy James Bond type thing. You should watch it. It's very good. We're used to seeing that type of character be very suave and in control, and although he probably doesn't have great interpersonal relationship skills, we would never normally question why. PTSD. James Bond has PTSD. The government aren't helping him with it. But Archer frequently mistimes the things he says in a way that others read as being just a pig. He has an encyclopedic knowledge of weapons and can keep track of bullet shots even in the heat of battle without actually trying. Throughout the series, he questions himself whether he's on the spectrum, and the show doesn't portray that negatively, just as a, wow, this explains so much. It's a great way of turning the nerdy guy stereotype on its head. The 2017 Power Rangers reboot also turned the burdensome genius trope on its head. Billy is an autistic teenager who struggles with knowing when to stop talking, reading between the lines, and some OCD tendencies, but he's not white, his symptoms aren't overly exaggerated, and the other characters come to just love having him around. They're not just putting up with him because he's skilled. Another really good version of trope smashing is Julia, a new Muppet on Sesame Street. And I love disabled representation in children's shows because I think it's the best way to teach future adults how to be accepting. You have to get them while they're young. 
much easier than trying to work backwards. In the episode Meet Julia, she's introduced to Big Bird through her friends Elmo and Abby Cadabby, who explain that, although she interacts with others in a different way and has some sensitivities, like hating loud noises, she is a great friend and a happy person. Big Bird understands once she panics on hearing a fire engine siren and then panics harder when Big Bird touches her shoulder to try and calm her down. She is also performed by a puppeteer with an autistic son. Fun fact! According to the New York Times, one autistic child on watching Julia told his mum that there was already an autistic Muppet, Fuzzy Bear. He repeats words and phrases over and over, takes everything completely literally, and has an esoteric sense of humour that no one else seems to understand. Special mention goes to Renee from Pixar's short film Loop, who is a non-verbal autistic girl who spends the day in a canoe with a chatty boy called Marcus who has to learn how to communicate with her. Not only is Renee actually played by an autistic girl who uses her voice in the same way, but the entire film is made with an autistic audience in mind as well as a general one. Filmmakers checked everything from the script to the sounds to the colours used with the Autistic Self Advocacy Group. It's a really beautiful short and if you have Disney Plus you should watch it. Also we now have Disney Plus because my wife needs to watch Mulan often because representation is important kids even when it's flawed. Abed from the show Community is never actually mentioned to be on the spectrum, but he reads as such and he is quite clearly written that way, to the extent that the showrunner, Dan Harmon, whilst doing research on how to write the character, recognised so many of the tropes in himself that he then went to a doctor and got diagnosed with autism. So, not entirely sure why they don't just say it in the show. Abed is incredibly fascinated with films and television and obsessed with projecting their tropes onto real life. He becomes highly distressed whenever anyone tries to tamper with his very structured life and has a very cold, sterile demeanour. He's uninterested in social graces and occasionally has meltdowns which he signals with a high-pitched whine. There's also a musical episode where he sings, on the spectrum, none of your business, to the audience. But it's much kinder than other showrunners and actors have been when the autistic community tells them that a character reads as autistic, which get on to that later. Let's talk first about bad representation and I think we're going to have to bring Rain Man back for this category. So a number of respondents mentioned that despite Dustin Hoffman's Oscar winning performance, 95% of actors who've won an Oscar for playing a disabled character aren't actually disabled. We see you Marley Madeline. So despite Dustin Hoffman's performance, the autism depicted in Rain Man is said to be just too simplistic. It also serves merely as a plot device to teach Tom Cruise not to be an asshole. so... Raymond isn't actually a character himself, despite the Oscar, and the film has no issues asserting that autistic adults are childlike and lack agency, but it's the dominant portrayal of autism. Many autistic people find that the media motive of the autistic savant is insulting. Whilst it's true that savant syndrome is a real thing, only 10% of those with autism have savant abilities, so... If that's the only portrayal we see, what does that say about the other 90% that their stories aren't worth telling? It also implies that although autism, despite being to various degrees impairing, comes with desirable gifts, which can then feel invalidating to people who are struggling with it. And whilst we're on the subject of insulting one's audience, Sugar from the show Glee claims to have Asperger's syndrome, but whilst she exhibits practically every negative characteristic of the condition, she seems to use it mainly as an excuse to be awful. She mentions that she's self-diagnosed and it seems like the creators wanted to use her as some kind of gotcha to people who say they're diagnosed with something, just so they can behave badly or they're trying to make a joke about self-diagnosis, which isn't great. Self-diagnosis is often needed and valid for people in a variety of different marginalised communities who don't have access to expensive healthcare or suffer from gatekeeping. She makes me feel very weird. Look, I'm not autistic myself, so I'm not necessarily a great barometer of what is and isn't a good depiction of an autistic character. I'm telling you what my audience think. But I can tell you what an ugly one looks like because we all know that things like portraying an actual living, breathing human being as a soul-crushing burden is horrible. And I'm looking at you, 80s and 90s films. 
To me, a bad representation of autism in film and TV is a very narrow perspective of what autism is. If you think of types of pasta, you would think for maybe five different types of pasta. There are 350 different types of pasta with four times that many names. When you think of autism in the context of pasta, it affects each individual in a variety of ways. It is very hard to generalize. It is very easy to understand why script writers only focus on four or five different points of autism. Autism. Given how varied it can be, only four or five points doesn't even begin to describe how autism can affect each individual. Oh, and now I'm looking at you, Grey's Anatomy. The show dropped in an autistic guest doctor into season five, who was just so cold that when a 16 year old died on the operating table, she said, this is good news, since she could now harvest her organs out. She also had a sensory overload meltdown that required her to be hugged, which isn't white. How it works like physical pressure over large parts of your body will slow your heart and calm your sympathetic nervous system but have you seen the size of christina you're not getting a lot of pressure from her although being hugged by sandra would be really nice most people complained that it felt like the show was just fulfilling a quota and it was but don't jump on me for defending Grey's anatomy i'm so sorry i can't help it Although it likely just dropped in Dr. Dixon to make up for its previous insulting portrayals of people with autism, she does stress to the other doctors that even though she doesn't perceive condescension and sarcasm, she does know when she's being deceived and made fun of. The main thread of her storyline is actually that the other characters have very little awareness of autism and can be insulting even when trying their best, which I guess is the show saying the same thing that they were trying. No, okay, never mind, move on. To the most divisive character of them all. Uh -huh. The difficulties inherent in depicting autism and other neuroatypical conditions is one reason for the popularity of what is known in media critic circles as ambiguous disorder, where your character has a thing. They definitely have a thing. It's not exactly definitely that thing, so it must be this thing, but it's definitely a thing. And thus we come to Sheldon Cooper from The Big Bang Theory. Gosh, wow. Everyone seems to have strong feelings. Within the already quirky show, Sheldon is regarded as having behaviour that is far outside the norm, but no one puts a name to it. He is clearly socially challenged, has monotonous speech, and exhibits heavily ritualised behaviour, including creating a schedule for bodily functions. He has hypersensitive hearing and an eidetic memory, meaning he remembers everything about everything, which can actually be apparently quite traumatic and debilitating in real life since you don't ever get over bad things that happen or how you felt about them. Remember how embarrassed you were when that person you said you fancied said that they didn't like you? Well, now you have to hold on to that exact feeling forever and just pile up other feelings feelings on top of it too. Unless you're ace, in which case, nicely swerved. Sheldon feels a constant need to control everything, to the point where he makes roommates sign a several pages long document of his roommate agreement. He also makes his girlfriend sign first a friendship agreement and later a relationship agreement. His empathy is non-existent and he consistently displays narcissistic behaviour, having convinced himself he's the smartest in the group and completely dismissing any other friend's achievements. All four of the characters had issues at the start of the show, but the other three evolved to some degree, marking Sheldon out as different. Whilst Leonard struggled with keeping eye contact at the start of the series, he overcomes it down the line, showing that it was low self-esteem he struggled with rather than any internal disorder. Sheldon's behaviour is clearly disordered and yet it's also played for laughs in a way that were the writers actually to put a name on it would certainly not be acceptable. They tend to focus on the laugh producing elements, understandable for a sitcom perhaps, but without having to deal with how serious some of his issues are and how much distress he must internally be in. However, it's important to note that not all autistic people feel the same way about Sheldon's character, and some see themselves represented. The writers say that they never wrote his character to be autistic. As an autistic person myself, I can see a lot of what could be considered as autistic traits in Sheldon. The main thing that Sheldon lacks is a theory of the mind, well known in autism, as he struggles to understand the views and experience of the other person. So he lacks empathy and is unable to adjust his behaviour to the situation. The other big thing to me is that he lacks independent skills and relies on other people to help him with every aspect of his life. This includes going shopping, ordering food, his obsession with trains, refusing to go anywhere on the bus and having to be driven everywhere. I wouldn't say that I feel represented by him, I do recognise his traits however. What particularly talks to me is his lack of independence, making him extremely vulnerable. This does disturb me the most as it actually represents my main field of difficulty. His dependence on his friends to do the most basic 
basic everyday things may be used for comedic effect. But for me, this is a reality that I'll always have to deal with every single day. And this is what makes so many autistic people vulnerable. If this was in real life, this would be far from funny. This is why that you can feel sympathetic towards him as it becomes the figure to be made fun of or to get angry at. Many clubbies and respondents to my Twitter thread pointed out that it was Sheldon's lack of a diagnosis that was part of the problem. Were he to have an official diagnosis of autism, we might just have a show where an autistic person and his friends do funny things. But because he isn't given an in-universe diagnosis, that leaves the very traits that code him as autistic open to ridicule. They pointed out that although his performance is certainly over the top, his friends often are still mocking him to a laugh track. Plus he's often portrayed as deeply selfish and unaware of it, but the other characters allow him to act that way because it's his thing, which sort of implies that autistic people lean into their own traits and get their own way and that they're just bad people who are really, really annoying to everyone else, so. Fabulous. I saw that the writers of the show have also asserted that Sheldon is the way he is due to childhood trauma, which is A, not how autism works, and B, implies that he could be cured, which then leads us down a really sticky path. Many in the autistic community have spoken out about his betrayal, and many, many articles have been written, but he isn't technically autistic if the writers say he isn't right? Or can a character still be considered autistic if the audience sees them that way despite what the writers say? Headcanon, it's a thing. And you should read Erin's article on Queerly Autistic about why she prefers her autistic headcanons to characters who are explicitly written to be autistic. That's linked in the description. Headcanon, by the way, is a fan's personal idiosyncratic interpretation of canon, such as the backstory of a character or the nature of relationships between two characters. The term comes from the fact that it is the canon that exists in a fan's head. Like Buffy and Faith, now living together with cute little kids, 100% exists in my head. According to Erin, when non-autistic writers create autistic characters, they tend to get so bogged down in the tropes that they make the characters one-dimensional and unrealistic. Due to that, she connects more with characters within whom she sees autistic traits, but who aren't deliberately written to tick every box on the autism checklist. Sherlock Holmes is an example of one such character. Wrong Sherlock. Wrong Sherlock. That Sherlock. There are so many Sherlocks. And, in a way, they're all the correct Sherlock. Although the Sherlock from the British TV show Sherlock defines himself as a high-functioning sociopath, John, who is a medical doctor, although not that kind of medical doctor, at one point states that Sherlock has Asperger's. He is inappropriate when in social situations, insufferably clever, and unable to truly understand others' emotions and obsessively interested in solving crimes. His family members are also no strangers to autistic traits. When this was pointed out to said writers and the actor who played him, Benedict Cumberbatch, it wasn't particularly well handled and the response was more than a little ableist, including calling it lazy to say that Sherlock is in any way autistic because, and I quote, I've met people with those conditions. It's a real struggle all the time. Then these people, like Sherlock and Alan Turing, pop up in my work and they're sort of brilliant and they on some levels almost offer false hope for the people who are going through the reality of it. What? Because what? What? I realise that I just said not all portrayals of autistic people should be geniuses, but that doesn't mean they can't be. He also then compared autistic people to Frankenstein's monster, whilst talking about his part as the creature in a production of Frankenstein, and described seeing autistic people as very upsetting. Which, wow, so sorry for you. But we can still argue that Sherlock can be read as autistic, and thus so are characters who are based on Sherlock, and I'm looking at you, surprising number of TV doctors, detectives, and forensic pathologists, whatever Bones is. Every type of Sherlock Holmes. Apparently, and completely unsurprisingly for anyone who has ever watched the show, Dr. Brennan in Bones is supposed to be written as if she has Asperger's or a level of autism, although it's never actually stated on screen, and where she is on that spectrum wildly fluctuates from episode to episode. She's always socially impaired, completely literal, and highly intelligent, however. Elementary's version of Sherlock, yeah, that's the right one, displays many of the normal Sherlock quirks, along with an array of symptoms like constant fidgeting, an obsession with order and routine, and a very addictive personality. He then dates a woman who is actually stated as being autistic, and she makes a point that she can't tell whether he is also autistic or not. Whilst modern portrayals of Sherlock tend to play 
clearing up the socially challenged tendencies, the 2009 Sherlock Holmes film and its 2011 sequel, A Game of Shadows, have Robert Downey Jr.'s Sherlock struggling with eye contact, exhibiting some sensory integration issues, and this is actually more accurate to the original stories by Conan Doyle. He is written to be incredibly antisocial with a number of inappropriate habits and an utter single-minded obsession with crime solving that sees him prone to bouts of lethargy and depression when he has no case to keep him occupied. Also there's a lot of cocaine. I mean that's not related, but you should know the books have a lot of cocaine. Magically autistic. Like many other real-world atypical neurological conditions, there are a fair few portrayals of autism as either inherently or the result of something supernatural. In some uses of this trope, all cases of a particular neurological or psychiatric condition are the result of supernatural circumstances, and you can't have one without the other. Other times, the given condition can be caused by something supernatural, but the same condition can also develop without the involvement of the paranormal. In the TV show Alphas, the characters each have some kind of mental or physical disability to accompany their magical ability. Gary is autistic, but he's also able to sense and translate radio waves and his brain is considered too rigid for magical suggestion. Another character, Anna, is a non-verbal autistic woman who can only communicate via online text, but also speaks every language ever. The Stephen King miniseries, Rose Red, has Annie Wheaton, an autistic teenager with telekinetic powers, who makes art that imitates life. No, wait, makes art that initiates life, that's the one, including drawing her drawing, then making rocks crush her neighbour's house, is the thing. She's also pretty chatty when you talk to her telepathically, but not otherwise. In fact, children with powers that make them seem autistic is a pretty big trope in itself, although they aren't, often aren't characters themselves, they're just sort of more props for the lead to work around. In the first episode of Eli Stone, a show that is based on the premise that a man's brain tumour has made him a prophet, the seemingly strange actions of an autistic child are actually a way that God communicates with Eli, because this child isn't a person with agency. He might as well be a supernatural rock. Oh, while we're discussing magical rocks, Twilight! Some fans read autism into Bella's character in the books. She gives very little thought to the consequences of her actions, and she tends to not understand why people react the way they do. She admits that she has trouble connecting with people in general, and that her only friend in Phoenix was her mother, who she still forgets to write to when she moves to Forks, because she's become obsessed with something else, namely being a vampire, whilst making no plans for life should she not become one. I mean, that's also like straight girl YA trope, but sure. I'm obsessed with a boyfriend. No other character trait. She's unhealthily obsessed with Edward to the extent that when he leaves her, she first is catatonic and then makes no effort to move on with her life, instead choosing to spend her college money on motorcycles and nearly killing herself cliff diving. As you do. Edward's theory on why he can't read her thoughts is that her mind works differently than others, which, I mean, if you put everything together, certainly interesting. I don't know. What do you think, Twilight fans? I've never read the books, and I've only seen the last film. Don't hate me. Other magical powers that come with autism include deciphering the predator's language near instantly and seamlessly interfacing with alien tech. Did you know? The Predator film actually presents autism as humanity's next step in evolution, but this video is already really long, so let's not dive into that. Actually autistic. What is the number one most important thing to remember in portrayals of autistic people? Higher autistic people. To me, a good representation of autism in film and TV is when the writers get very specific to the character that has autism. They need to have a good understanding of how autism affects a variety of people in all sorts of different ways. When scripting an autistic character, it's probably a good idea to have actors who are even autistic or have a very good understanding of the effects of autism. It could even be a good idea to have more than one character with autism who are both affected completely different by autism. That way we can have a good idea on what the differences are. There's a phrase called disabled mimi cry when non-disabled actors play disabled characters. I'm really opposed to that because it's not something people can take on and off, right? It's not It's not a wig. It's not a color of, of someone's hair. It's not a uniform. It is a fully lived in experience that someone has. It gives people the idea 
this like subconscious idea about like faking disabilities and how like you could easily portray a disability through your physical actions and autism a lot of it is so so internal um people like myself uh there's often disbelief about the fact that we are autistic at all because we're very good at camouflaging ourselves to appear like neurotypicals but that doesn't change the fact that we're autistic and as long as disabled characters are played by non-disabled actors I feel like there's always going to be this thing in people's minds that like it's something like autism is going to be something that you can see no matter what and it's going to be something that you can inhabit physically through the form of acting. It's not always going to be like that. I mentioned everything's going to be okay earlier and according to many people what makes Matilda such a great portrayal of an autistic person is that the actress playing her is not only on the spectrum but is allowed to be open about things in the script she feels don't fit and change them. Matilda's storyline is about her desire to be seen as high functioning and how much effort she has to put in to achieve that. She's stated as having been non-verbal as a three-year-old, but her father put a lot of time into her therapy and she's put her well above average intelligence to learning enough social skills that she didn't have to be institutionalized. She goes to school with her neurotypical sister, although she's seen going to special needs classes with some other autistic children. There are even moments where she laments being a burden on her loved ones and says she's ashamed for everything she puts them through, which is painfully realistic for anyone with a disability. And it's lovely to have that be shown from her perspective, that she isn't an angel or a demon, she's just a person with needs. Thank you so much for watching this video. No, wait. Okay, no, I can't end this video without mentioning this tweet from Ali at Home, who, when asked for representation of autism, said, Ariel and the Little Mermaid. No socialization with other mermaids, intense interest in the surface, and her only friend is a fish who shares the same interest, no awareness of danger in pursuit of this interest, and her dad has to get her a support worker. She gets tricked by Ursula for being too trusting. She becomes selectively mute following this trauma, and she does not learn surface social rules by observing them. And on the carriage ride, she's distracted from everything else by the spinny carriage wheels. I enjoy how none of this is presented as problems. And I just, oh my God. That film makes so much more sense now. All these years. Ali, thank you for bringing this into my life. Thank you so much to Luke and Annie for being part of this video and for proofreading the script for me. I encourage you to follow them both. Their channels are linked in the description. For more information on autism, I would suggest you check out the following autistic creators here on YouTube. And if there are any you would like to promote, please do share their name in the comments. Purple Ella, rebranding autism, Savannah Films, The Aspie World, and I'm throwing in Plumella because I love her. Okay, bye-bye.